Um, thank you um, for coming tonight and uh, to our tonight's artist talk featuring Scott Logan. Um, I want to send a, extend a thank you to the Valleys without whom none of this would be possible. So thank you. <laughs> It is so great that we are able to get together tonight um, as a community uh, connected to the shared interest of environmental conservation. We are very lucky to have Scott here tonight, and thank you for braving the November show. Lucky here. Here. By LA Sims. So a little bit about our speaker. Um, Scott is an LA native and has been a nature lover his entire life with a vast knowledge of local wildlife. He is the co-owner of Wild Wings Ecology in Sherman Oaks and educates enthusiasts all around Southern California. Um, he has spent excessive time photographing the Valley Bay's garden, examples of which are all around you in this room. The room is in the, the two rooms adjacent to this one um, features mostly the photography by Scott. Um, Mapper photography is featured in this room, which we'll be talking more about in this talk. Um, and actually, photography by Dan Susan Valley is in the room where the drinks. The snacks are. So please, I hope you've got a chance to look around. If you haven't, there'll be time after the talk for you to get up, walk around, ask questions, and um, feel free to ask uh, Scott, myself, or Ed any questions that you may have about the gallery or the exhibit. Um, this is actually his first talk about his photography, <laughs> so be nice. <laughs> but please feel free to raise your hands throughout the presentation. Scott is happy to answer any of your questions throughout. Hi, right, good evening everyone, and thanks so much for coming and spending your Thursday evening here at the gallery. Um, before we begin, I myself want to thank uh, Dan and Susan uh, for the generous support of uh, all of these wildlife, local wildlife causes here in LA. Um, and for the past 10 years of having a gallery and allowing artists like, uh, photographic artists like myself to show their work in the gallery. Um, but beyond that, I personally want to thank Susan and Dan um, because this show literally wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for them. Um, they've been great supporters of my photography for years now. And um, they've helped me expand my vision on what a uh, good wildlife image is. So thank you very much. Um, I'm forever indebted to you guys. Okay, so uh, let's begin. Um, we'll call this the Valley Native Garden an even closer look. Okay, so basically all the images that are in this gallery and the other two galleries are all from one yard. And they're from one yard here in Los Angeles. To me, that's the most powerful thing about it because people don't think of our wildlife as being uh, interesting and beautiful, especially on a very small scale. Um, but when you have a very good close-up look of it, it is. Um, this is the this is a one area in the garden. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Um, theater Paint Garden Tour uh, does two days there at the garden. It's very worth going to have a look uh, uh, yourself. Here is one of the days um, uh, of the Theater Paint Garden Tour. And I think this last year they got five people. The garden. Um, but this is such the example of build it and they will come. Not only are people interested in it, and there's a groundswell now of uh, native plants to support native animals, but the, the native animals themselves have come as well. Um, I originally got involved in the garden um, to catalog bird species. So I started coming visiting the garden seeing what birds were showing up. Um, it's now been two and a half years to be doing that, and we're up to 93 species of birds in one garden. And when people say there's not, uh, there's not a lot of bird life uh, here in Los Angeles, then it is like, them up very quickly. Um, uh, once, uh, or actually while I was doing this, um, there was a book being put together. It's the Gothic Native Garden at California Love Story. Um, I was lucky enough to sneak a few of my photos in that book. The majority of those photos are Susan's and, and uh, Dan's. Um, but while all this was going on, I, began, I got more and more involved in the garden, and I went beyond birds, and I started cataloging um, 
all species in the garden, all animal species. Um, so that would be from insects all the way up to the animals. And that led into me running a blog, and if you guys want to see what's going on in the garden at any time, you can go to the Gottlieb Native Garden, check out the Wild Earth Journal, and I'm usually posting once and sometimes twice a week of uh, what uh, I found in the garden of uh, that particular week. So, uh, how am I cataloging these animals? Uh, for the most part, it's with photography. Um, I find that really valuable to try and get down to species level on, especially insects and spiders and things like that, um, because uh, I don't want to be collecting, for the most part, any animals in the garden. Um, and through photography now, there's different sites, and there's different colleges that will help you out. Um, we've been able to identify hundreds of species of animals now in the yard. Um, that is the spider that I was taking a picture at that moment. That's a grass spider. You can tell it's quite a large spider because it has a European honeybee there. And it's grass. Um, other ways that we're cataloging the species of animals in the garden are with uh, remote cameras. Um, there are many places throughout the garden. Um, this happens to be a watering trough that's down the back garden, and it's visited a lot by raccoons. They just love water and washing stuff in there. Uh, it's, it's visited by many, many animals, um, including not too long ago, a bobcat. Uh, another way um, that I'm cataloging animals is I, I, I go there at night. Um, I try to get there at least every other month um, to set up UV lights. Insects are attracted to UV lights, and so as the insects land on the sheets that are covering the lights, then I photograph them and then I view them um, later. We're, we've gone as far as to even be tracking the bats that are to the yard. Um, this is a microphone that records sonograms or bat calls. Um, we're now up to three species of bats in the garden. Um, but it was this image here that changed my perspective of what I wanted to do uh, in the garden beyond just cataloging uh, animals. This is a white crowned sparrow, and one of my favorite birds of fall because you never really know weather wise when fall is arriving here in Southern California, but that bird tells us because when it arrives, it's fall. And um, for the most part, sparrows only sing on their breeding ranges. But this particular sparrow sings year round, and they breed as far north as the Arctic tundra and they come down here to winter. And for whatever reason, they'll expend energy to still sing down here as they would up on their green territory. So when you begin to hear that song, you know that we're into uh, late September or November, and it's, it's fall. But what that image did for me personally was I realized, well, there's a lot of great opportunities here in the yard to take photographs on a more artistic level than just trying to take it for ID purposes. So from this point on, when I would come across different animals that I thought was a good opportunity for a photograph, then I would try to get a nice photograph besides just cataloging that animal with a photograph. And this is a juvenile alligator lizard, um, which was very different than the adult alligator lizard. Um, insects as well. This is a praying mantis, and this happens to be a native praying mantis. And this is where photography really comes into play. Because unless I collected that praying mantis, I wouldn't know what species it was. And the majority of praying mantises that we have here in Los Angeles are non-native. And the reason why they're non-native is because nurseries sell their egg cases. And then people buy them, put them in their yards for organic uh, insect control. It's kind of a haphazard kind of scorched earth insect control because these guys eat everything. Um, but those egg cases that they sell at nurseries, um, are all non-natives, they're for the most part oriental species. So getting a native uh, praying mantis for me was exciting, I was very happy about that. Um, but as I began taking these photographs, I began getting a pretty good collection of animals from the yard, and that's when Susan uh, began to wonder, well, should we do a second book? So I've been collecting more and more images um, and to the point of, yeah, I think that we have enough for a second book. So for those of you who know the first book, um, they're planning on doing companion to that book now, even more images of the animals that this garden is attracting. Um, that's where part of this exhibit, well, I should say most of the exhibit, 
is, is that in those photographs, um, especially some of the bird portraits, um, we were getting some really good stuff. And for those of you who've been to Dan and Susan's yard know that there are a lot of hummingbirds there. <laughs> and the, the opportunity to photograph hummingbirds there is ridiculous. And I'm very jealous of Dan because Dan goes out there about every afternoon and he takes pictures of hummingbirds. <laughs> the, the, it's just, seriously, it's, it's endless. This is an endless hummingbird at a Manzanita flower. Um, that's a, a adult Alan's mail at a, a, a snapdragon. Flower. Um, but beyond the hummingbirds, there's a lot of other birds there as well. This is a house wren, and in my photography, I'm doing my best, at least when I'm doing this type of photography, I'm doing my best to try to bring across the personality of the animal. Sometimes birds can be very easy, um, as in that particular bird, if you're wondering what the heck I'm doing there, what am I doing, why am I there, go away, please, that, that, that's it. That house wren with its tail cocked up like a kind of classic cheeky wren pose. The other thing that's really cool about the garden is, is, is that you're perched up high. So you can get on top of you as a bird as they fly by. Um, that's a juvenile red tail hawk. And uh, just to throw in a little ID thing for you guys, uh, the reason why that's a juvenile is, is because it has that patterned tail. Um, it's, when you're looking at hawks up in the sky, you happen to see a hawk that has a red tail, you know, it's a red tail hawk. Sometimes you can't see that red tail. The reason why you can't see that red tail is because the red will be on top of the tail. Underneath red tail, hawks' feathers are cream colored. So it's as the sun shines through the tail, you see the red. If this was an adult, we would see a great red tail with trimmed in black and white. Um, but again, the, the opportunity for birds in, this, in the yard is phenomenal. This is a permit thrush. These guys have just arrived recently. They breed in uh, wet boreal forests. Um, this is a juvenile cooper's hawk. For any of you that feed birds or are used to uh, you know, uh, uh, watching a hawk come into bird life, this is our bird hunting hawk here. Um, this juvenile had happened to fly into the yard and missed as they usually do, um, and went and landed on this branch. It was raining that day, and to me, just has a look of, you know, kind of just figure out how to do this. <laughs> really hungry. Um, because uh, they live out near Chaparral, um, we also get Chaparral birds that come in. This is a California quail. Now, there are certain groups of birds that are indicator species of birds to me that I know, well, if you have a quail in your yard, you have an opportunity to get many, many different species of birds to associate themselves with chaparral. Um, but the majority of these animals that we're looking at, and the majority of these animals in this exhibit, anyone can get anywhere here in LA. Um, but this would be a particular bird that you need to live by chaparral. So those are sort of my, my bird portraits, and that's sort of the feeling I'm trying to get, because I'm trying to get the personality, like, for instance, this is a male California. California quail. It was two males who were roaming the hillside looking for girls, and I had to catch them. So, I was happy with the bird portraits I was getting, but I wanted to figure out how to get good insect or very small animal portraits and have an angle that would be a little bit different. Um, during this time of taking those bird pictures and collecting images for the book, um, Susan started thinking about maybe we should do an exhibit at the G2. And I thought, well, the bird images are cool, but I would love to figure out an angle to have something done a little bit differently, and I love sort of portrait style uh, images of animals. But when you're doing macro photography, you're always dealing with super shallow depths of field. So although it appears uh, that its face is very uh, in focus, um, the focus drops off very quickly because I'm so close to that subject. And then when you blow it up, you realize, yeah, there is a lot of detail there. In fact, you can see how his left eye there is even collapsed. Um, why, who knows? But uh, it's not super sharp. So I just didn't, I, I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to create personal portraits by shooting macro in this way. So enter. Uh, Jim de Revere's. Um, he is a uh, he's the one who helped me or started me on the road to solving these technical problems. 
Um, he's a moth collector from Ottawa, Canada. And he started working with a process of Xeroxing moths uh, in such a way that it brought out all the detail of their scales uh, to, to a phenomenal um, degree. Um, I met him because, and maybe some of you here went to his exhibit. Um, it was Moss at Large. I think it might have been the second exhibit here, or the second time he showed here, but this was his exhibit. He had an idea that in that exhibit, he would like to have two moths that are local moths that can be found here in the Los Angeles area, but he, would, he didn't know where to find them. So it was suggested that um, him and I hook up that maybe I could help him find them. One of the moths that he wanted to find was this one. This is a uh, Ceanothus silk moth. Um, and as I explained to him, I found these many times dead, but I'd never seen one alive. And they're, they're a large moth. They're, they're about this big. Wow. And they're, they're, they're stunningly gorgeous, but I'd never seen one alive. In fact, this one was collected in the Gabaldian Garden. Um, which means that, yes, we can add that a species to the garden, even though it was dead, we know that it got there on its own, so that species is in the garden. Um, so what I did was I went out with one of my portable light rigs into a uh, proper habitat, um, looking for this moth, and uh, I was able to get him uh, a species, or a specimen, and that's what I collected. I ended up collecting two, a male and a female. This is the male, and the, and the way you can tell male and female moths, for the most part, is moths have their furry antennas, right? Uh, the male's antennas, uh, those hairs that come out are far shorter than the females. Excuse me, let me I just said that backwards. The females are far shorter than the males. And the reason why the males have such large antennas is they're trying to pick up on the pheromone of the females. The females are releasing a pheromone, the males are trying to pick up on that, and they come. So we had both a male and a female example. He ended up choosing uh, the uh, male for the exhibit, so there it is uh, in the end. Now, I realized that I really, really liked what he was doing. He had figured out a way to get really high resolution um, images of these moths. Um, to give you an example, you can see the detail. It's crazy. And for those of you who um, know photographic files, these are native like gigabyte files. Like he could blow this up the size of a building. They, they're amazing. And the way he's doing it is, is that he's capturing the moth. He euthanizes the moth. He pins it, dries it for a couple of days, and turns it upside down and xeroxes it. And it's done with specific software and specific Xerox machine um, that is able to get that. It took him a while to figure it out. Um, this is the second moth I collected for that exhibit. And this moth made an exhibit. In fact, this moth was from Susan and Dan's yard. This is a white line sphinx moth. Now, for me and a lot of people, well, I, let me take that back. I love this, and I love all natural history, and I, and I love the look of these because to me they're kind of like 18th century scientific drawings, you know, um, and I love that. Um, but there's no personality there for sure. It's just a very scientific sort of look. What happened with this exhibit for some people I talked to, people from family members and other things, is that there was this knee-jerk reaction when people realized that these moths were dead. Now, I personally had no problem with that because moths, for the most part, don't live very long. The larval stage and pupil stage of this particular moth is about nine months, and the moth itself lives for about four days. So, so moths don't, when they're in this state, they're looking to hook up and, you know, and, and keep their species going. It's the only reason why they're in this stage. The majority of their life is lived in other stages. So to me, him euthanizing this moth is not that big of a deal. It was going to die anyway. And if you're going to use it to turn people onto nature, fine. Um, but it's very static. And, and, and again, there was this knee-jerk reaction of, well, these are dead. The other thing is, is that some people thought it was a little bit disin uh, disingenuine because, or uh, disgenuine because, people didn't know walking into the exhibit that they were dead. So now I thought, OK, I have to figure out how to do this with live 
<clears throat> months, and that was my challenge. So um, I'm, again, born and raised here since a little kid. I've been rocking around in the mountains, out everywhere, um, playing with animals. It's just, it's my love. Um, and I have no problem finding animals. I have no problem interacting with animals. Um, I kind of, and, and in the heads of the majority of our wildlife that's here. This is another sphinx moth. Um, this, is, this is called a, uh, an elegant sphinx moth. Um, so how was I going to approach making a portrait of this moth? So I can find the moth, I can control the moth, um, but how do I get it to there? That was my problem. Mm -hmm. So I knew by talking with uh, Jim, I knew that there was a road that I could follow, and he gave me some information on uh, how different people were doing things, and one of them was <coughs> focus stacking. Now, focus stacking has been going on for quite a while in the scientific realm because a science has figured out that through microscopes they could get much better resolution on images if they did stacking. If they would just take these minute uh, uh, focal changes of a particular cell or whatever it was and get these really brilliant photographs. Um, some of these devices are quite, are quite uh, I mean, they're, they're machines. Like this has a separate uh, motor and stacking controller and they're extremely expensive and they're very sterile. And I knew, well, if I could figure out how to do that with the DSLR, then maybe I could do what I'm thinking about doing. Because that's what my rig would normally look like. And this is me taking macro photography outside. Um, and you'll notice there's flashes there. I'm always using flashes in macro photography outside because you get such fast light fall off that uh, I don't like the black backgrounds, although I intentionally did them on these. But, um, I, I, I need to use fill flash for so much on macro photography. The problem with stacking something like this is the moment you touch your camera, you've moved it. The other, you, you, and, and if you move it the slightest amount, it's gonna, it, it will not, the images will not stack properly. So the second thing that, uh, um, that you can't do with your hand is you can't do very specific focus points. So I knew that focus stacking was the first part of my problem, um, but it was how do I control my camera without touching it and getting it to focus to the points that I wanted to focus. And that's when I discovered this device. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It's called Cam Ranger. And basically what it does is it controls either Nikons or Canons um, from an iPad or iPhone or whatever you want. You can control every aspect of the camera focus, ISO, everything you can control. It even has a setting where it can go through a series of shots. You can tell it, well, I want you to do 20 shots, change the focus this amount each time in this amount of time. Um, so I thought, okay, great. I've got the, the, the device to make my series of shots. So here's my high-tech studio. Again, this is back with that Sphinx moth. So the Sphinx moth that you guys saw, what I basically did is I just put it in a container and I brought it back to our shop and, it's, and kept it there until I set up this little set. And basically that's just a paper backdrop and I let the light fall off and that's how I get the black background. Notice that some of the backgrounds on the lower portions of them is lighter than the top. Um, and you'll notice that there's an iPad down below and that's where I'm controlling the camera in that series of stats. So what, what are the series of stats? Essentially what it is, is you start at a focal point and you end at a focal point and you decide how many shots you want to take in between. Every one of those shots is going to be focused a little bit further, 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 further through. And as you can see on this image, um, I'm focused about right there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let this play through. And so essentially right now, this is going through 50 plus shots. And you're going to notice if you watch it, the focus is going to just be moving through that fly. By the way, this is a butterfly. Same butterfly that's in the exhibit somewhere. Now there's two problems. One, you notice he keeps moving his abdomen. The second is, is, is that there's something going wrong with my key light. And as it goes through, sometimes the key lights is not as bright as in other shots. That's a problem when you end up stacking all these images together. So while he's moving his abdomen there, I didn't really realize it. 
Um, but I will continue on until, if you continue watching, you're going to notice he moves his wings. Now, the way this is done is, is that because I'm using Nikon speed lights, they're, uh, hang on, hang on one second, watch, watch how he moves his wings. Um, and there, that wind's moving. <laughs> that just killed that. <laughs> these, th these things are battles. And for everything that you see here, if there's 20 of them that didn't work, and then there's another 20 different animals that I couldn't control. They have to stay still through that whole thing. So now you notice that when I saw him do that, there's where the focal point ended, because I wasn't going to continue through. The shot was ruined. Um, what I'm doing is, is that I don't tell, like, oh, there's lots of uh, different ways to create that series of shots. In fact, again, for any of you guys who are into um, equipment, you know that the D850, Nikon D850 is coming out, and it will allow you to set up a stacking series. You can't do that with live animals because they do stuff like that. They move, and now it's ruined, and you want to be able to stop and start again. The way I'm doing this is, is that I tell the, the camera, okay, do a shot, focus, do a shot, focus. And I have to do it that way because I have to allow my speed lights to charge up. This is not something that just goes in a fast uh, sort of series. That means that something like that, which is 240 shots, 240 shots, that guy that cat couldn't move. And believe me, he moved a lot. So <laughs> it's a battle. Every one of these is a battle. Okay. Um, now, I'm able to take that series of shots, but how now do I stitch them all together? Enter Zyrene Stacker. I discovered that there was stacking software that worked all the different stacking software works similarly, and basically what it does is it, it finds the sharpest packets of pixels and combines them with the next sharpest packet of pixels all the way through the series of images that you put into it. There's many different software that does this. In fact, even Photoshop does it. Um, but the problem with Photoshop is, is, is that, uh, again, for those of you who are used to working with Photoshop, it creates a, an individual layer for every shot, and it creates a mask for that individual layer. That would be 240 layers and 240 masks, and you trying to figure out where you were, you would drive yourself completely insane. <laughs> what Simon Stacker does is uh, you can control it, it actually in a very wide range of ways. And basically, I had to create two files for me. Um, one of these files is called PMAX, and that's the one uh, that's on the left side. And basically, what that's doing is it's picking up uh, contrast. And it's, and it's uh, finding the, the, the difference in contrast through all those uh, that series of images you took. But the problem is, is that it creates a very noisy file and a, a, a color-shifted file. The one on the right is called Pmax, and that does it by uh, depth of field. So it's figuring out where the depth of field is the sharpest in that pixel pack. The problem with that one is, is, that, is where you get into all these hairs and all these things on stuff that's very small. Because uh, if you can imagine if you had two hairs crossing each other, as you pull back in your focus, those hairs are going to move. <laughs> so when you're so close to these things, those hairs, it, it, things that are close to each other cross each other all the time. And that, so doing depth of field, it, it does not do a very good job in any of these areas where uh, different elements are crossing over each other. Um, okay. uh, um, so this here, just for sake of showing you guys, this is the image that was made from that series that where he moved his wings. Um, so besides the lighting, um, you can see his wings are messed up. That's useless. Also, you can see how he was moving his abdomen around. There's some different things going on there. Um, but um, what Zygon Stacker does, and I'm going to assume that other stacking software does, is that it gives you um, options to retouch problems. You'll notice on the left, you can see a group of the files that were used to create this image. Um, at the bottom of that, there's my two files I was talking about earlier, the Dmax and the Pmax files. Um, and what you do is you begin retouching. It, the, the, it allows you to go in and, and retouch either one of those two files 
and we can fix in areas that it got wrong. So the way you kind of think about this, these stack of softwares is, is, is that it's, it's through its algorithms, it's deciding on what should be at that particular part of that image. And it doesn't get it right all the time, but it, it gets about 90% of it right. 10% of it you have to do yourself. And that is a laborious task. Especially when you begin working with hair, you can see how it's all blurry here. Um, if I, I am going to show you how you can fix things like this, but then there's other areas here where you can see, as I pull back in my focus, it doesn't know what to do with that particular area because uh, you know, at this point it's all there, but at that point it's not what I do with it. You have to start going in to individual files and retouching. Now, in this example, what I did is I chose my focal, the point where I was focused on is the rear part of this abdomen where I thought, okay, I can use that bit to fix that particular part of the image. Um, it gives you a tool that you can you may have a very, very tiny brush or a very large brush, just like Photoshop. So all I did was I just brushed in its abdomen from the frame that I liked, that was the portion that was still in the focus. So that's one way that you can do retouching with this. Um, so you notice these two files next to each other, this is the Pmax on the left, and, um, excuse me, the, D, the Dmax on the left, the Pmax on the right. Uh, you can see the problems here, the blurriness and all of that. They are sharp, but I don't know if you guys can notice, it's very, very grainy. But what you do is you start going through and you begin, uh, oh, so then actually you can see how you can pick different frames where here in this frame, its leg hairs were totally in focus. Um, but everything behind is not in focus, but you can go in and you can pick these pixels yourself and you can tell it, okay, I like where these pixels are, let's put them over there. Again, it's very laborious, it takes a very long time. Um, and you do it with a small brush. So here I'm just brushing in some of this um, area trying to fix it. Here, again, um, the hairs in that portion where the yellow circle is, I'm going to brush them in here. And you keep doing that until you end up with repairing as much of the image as you can. Oh, there, I was looking for the image. So, so he's, he's over there. Now, a after this talk, you guys go and look. You can look and try to find where that retouching is. That's the big trick in doing photo stacking with this software is, is that you have to decide how far am I going to go. Because you literally, if you want to get down to pixel level, you're going to be there for uh, weeks. So you have to just take it to a point and go, okay, that's as far as I'm going to go, and then hopefully it will be fine. And you can see that image over there, for the most part, it's fine. Um, here I'm giving an example of what it would look like coming out of Zyron Stacker when I was done. And then here, that's just the sharpness added to it, and I just did a little extra uh, touch up in Photoshop. Um, so there's the final image. <laughs> And that, well actually it's not exactly true. That's the image that created the image that's on the wall, but that's that fly. Um, so this is a rubber fly, this is a very aggressive fly. And believe me, he was not a good, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't interested in, in hanging out for very long, so I was very lucky to finally get a, a, a series where he was totally still. Now, insects, uh, they breathe by um, contracting and expanding their abdomen. And basically that just, through lots of pores through their exoskeleton, it sucks in air and it, and it spells air. So most of these insects are abdomens moving. And for instance, with this one here, um, although in that series you saw, it, he was moving it around, it's also expanding and contracting. And what I'm doing is, is I'm trying to time it right so that I'm doing it in the same spot every time. That doesn't work all the time either. So, in this photo stacking, one thing I really realized is you can get really, really creative. Um, this is a dark moth, which is a pretty cool moth, and this is when I first started working with it, trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with it, and what's going to look interesting, because that's how all of these go. Is you get this animal, and you don't know how he's going to behave, and you don't know where it's going to go, and you don't know how your lighting's going to be, and on and on and on and on, until finally you get this thing, sometimes that works. Well. Here you can see I'm having problems. I don't have my light set up yet right, and there's harsh shadows, and uh, he's pretty uninteresting there. But while I was looking at him, I was like, well, it's really interesting looking straight on. So, so I went and took him straight on. That moth is about 3 16ths of an inch long. 
And, and now, is that, does that show character of that mod? It's crazy. I mean, to me, it looks like a little rabbit or something. Yes? Do you intend to find the coloration for the Yes. Yeah. Um, for the, I try not to. Uh, 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 what I, well, first of all, they're all balanced kind of basically the same way. But does that moth look basically like that? Absolutely. Yeah, so like that, I didn't do anything crazy to make that headdress look all colorful like that. And that's <laughs> very true. The thing about wildlife, though, is this is about birds, moths, everything you can think of is, is that a particular individual, a particular life, a particular time are all going to look different. But is that a representation of that moth? Yes, 100%. Um, now, you, now, the thing that's so cool about this is that I'm, I'm focusing from the front end of him all the way to the back. And, and what, look at the detail that you get. Those are all individual scales. They, they look like hairs, but they're, they're technically scales. Um, and, and, it, it, the, and you can see also the facets in his eyes. The, if you can get the animal to stay still, the, <laughs> the resolution you get is just is insane. Now here's another moth that I found extremely interesting from the side. Now this is a, this is a very common moth, it's an alec moth that a lot of you would have in your backyard, actually right now this time of year. And normally when you're looking at it, it's on a wall or something. And it doesn't look as three-dimensional as this. And, and again, I started by series by taking a photograph of it against something flat. And I noticed, well, it looks more interesting from the side. And I was able to get him finally to pose like this for me. But again, the resolution is crazy. You can actually see the ends of the scales, how they're lobed. And the different, and you can see how you get this this light, nice light shine off of the scales when they're in a certain position. So, this is the kind of stuff where photo stacking is like you can't you can't do this just regular medical photography. It's impossible. Um, this is an image of um, a black spider wasp. And again, I'm going to reiterate: this is all from Susan and Dan's garden. It's the same with the flowers and the plants that I, that I posed them on. Uh, this is a black spider wasp, and this was kind of early in my experimenting of this project. And I, when I got this series and I put this together, I thought, wow, okay, there's something interesting going on here. And then I just was looking at it, and I, and I, and I really blew into it, and I was like, oh my god. Look at the detail of its claws. Now, this is a hunting wasp. It hunts spiders, and what it does is it goes up to a spider, and it grabs the spider, and you can see his grappling hooks that he grabs the spider with. You can also see what looks like some kind of moisture droplets that are on that seed pot. It may, it may be uh, sap or something, I don't know, but you can also see the hairs of that seed pot. So it's, I realized, okay, this is a combination of those highly scientific looking images and being able to do a portrait of something um, and try to get some character in it. Um, again, you can do some amazing stuff. This is the smallest. Uh, subject that I ever did. Um, again, um, I did a lot of wrangling with this. I did a lot of flying around. Um, I got lucky in a couple of series. I got lucky on this. Um, this is a um, uh, chalactid wasp, I believe is how you pronounce it. And to me, I really dug him because um, he, he has these back legs like this, that look like kind of fender flares from like a Plymouth or something. <laughs> this, this thing is four millimeters long. It is tiny. And to see it like this, it's just to me, it, it opens up this world like, oh my god, what is going on? You're not even noticing. <laughs> what has led so much, uh, what's been really cool to me is also when I find something, okay, so I have to come down species level. What species is this? What does it do? How does it behave? These wasps are extremely particular to being parasites of particular butterflies. This happens to be a parasite of hair street butterflies. And it'll end up laying its egg on its larva, and that's the larval leaf that that wasp larva, the, the butterfly larva, and then you get a wasp. But then it opens up this world of like, how does this wasp find that butterfly? How does it know? And so on. But again, this kind of stuff is what just this type of photography opens up. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you can do, which I find really cool, is because you're using uh, such open apertures when you're doing this, you're getting extreme depth of field, you can use that depth of field um, for that particular image. Um, this is a, a longhorn beetle, and you can see how it, the focus quickly falls off from that beetle as we move back. 
Um, that's because the beetle moved and I stopped. But then when I just ran that series, this is what I came out with. I'm like, okay, cool. And, and then what I did is sometimes I would use that. I would stop a series at a particular point and let that the depth of field all of a sudden fall off. And I and I did it with um, it's behind all you guys, but I did it with the crab spider, where I thought, well, all the all the flowers behind the crab spider were a little bit distracting. I'll let them go out of focus so that the focal point is on the crab spider itself. So again you have the ability to use that depth of field to your advantage instead of being a, a disadvantage. So Scott, there's a limit to how much you can actually go in and change within... Change what? Uh, change? Well, like when you showed the, um, like when the, the rubber fly, when you moved a little bit, mm -hmm. right? when you went in and changed those hairs. Right. And then you said when you're photographing that one, you stop because it moved. Right. So... Okay so, okay, so okay, so yeah, there, there, there is, there's okay, so um, if I'm understanding the question, is there like a window to correcting and yes. something that moved? There kind of is because you can imagine that if you were take, if you were going through and taking um, you know, your focal point was moving through an insect and the back end of it is very out of focus, but the back end moves a little bit. It's so out of focus that that software is going to ignore that. And when you get through to that point, if it's all in focus and not moving, the software will now use that. So yes, there is there is a little bit of wiggle room in there. But the problem is, is that that's not when they move. They move when you need it to be sharp at that point. For instance, if you're there, you're right up to their antenna, and you're like, okay, and boom, they move their antennas. <laughs> that's when they decide to move. But if they do move when it's out of focus, yes, there is, you can stitch that together so that it works. And, uh, sometimes, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Now, what I've done is, on all these images here, is if the animal happened to move, I, I, I just get up and I go again. And what a lot of people have said is, it's like, well, but if it doesn't matter, and if, it, if you're now just going through leaves or something, why don't you just keep going? I, I just stopped. Because to me, I just think if I can genuinely get that, that's my battle. Like, all these, again, represent a battle of being able to get through the whole thing, because I can't tell you the feeling of you being there for three hours. And you get through that all from one end to the other, and you just go, oh my god, I've got it. It's a wonderful feeling. So to me, again, I just try to be as genuine as possible with it. Um, again, here's my fancy studio. <laughs> and here I am um, after a few hours with um, a cicada. And this cicada would not stop climbing on top of the branch <laughs> and getting in this position. And what's, this is a very interesting thing about insects. Um, I learned this long ago, but now when I'm doing this type of photography, it really comes into play. Insects want to orientate themselves in a particular way. They, I don't know what the right reason is to it, but if, if that cicada decides, I want to go up on the stick, I'm going to turn sideways, and I'm going to po point north, north, uh, west, whatever, that's what I'm going to do, and I don't care what you do to me, that's the position I'm going to point, and that's where I'm going to go. And, it's, and, and I don't understand what... <clears throat> drives that and I don't understand what their system is where they decide to point a particular way in a particular fashion and that's all they're going to do. That's what he was doing to me. And I, that's why I took that video. I was just like, I was laughing at myself like, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to look that way again. But ultimately I won that battle. <laughs> and that's the image that I am getting of that cicada. It's just a, it's just a, it's a, it's just a battle of will. And and I didn't, you know, I don't know we him or cool him or nothing. All it was is just get him to walk. Oh, he's decided to fly. I'll capture him, put him back. He calms down, <laughs> put him back on the stick. He climbs on the stick, goes sideways, goes that direction. <laughs> but finally, I was able to get that series <laughs> Um I've also experimented with amphibians and some other things. Uh, this is a um, black belly slender salamander, again from Susan and Dan's yard. Um, you'll notice that my stack only got through the front part of the wood to the back of his head. But to me, it still is kind of cool, but I could not, I never was able to get him to stop moving, ever. Um, but I was able to get that, but you can see, even in that, you can see the detail, and I had never seen, I never knew there were blue stars on these things, but you can see that there's like the star pattern all over it, blues and browns. So by doing this, you bring out this detail that, again, you just cannot get with just normal uh, photography. Um, I've also experimented with lizards, but I've stopped with them because they're, they're just a nightmare. And 
releasing pheromones worth it for me to spend 45 minutes getting all set up. You might stay. And she did. And so I was able to get that shot. So that was out in the yard. Now the problem is about trying to do this outside is the slightest breeze will mess up the image. Because if there's any movement, it's, it's ruined. That was dead still night. So I got lucky and I did it. But even besides that, you can't see, but below that leaf, um, I clipped uh, the alligator clip connected to something else to keep everything as still as possible. Because again, if there's any movement, then it, it ruins this series. So that one was actually outside. The other one there was in the Gottlieb's living room. Everything else is all inside of our, uh, our studio. Um, all right, well, thanks for letting me share. Oh, sorry. So you're saying 50 or 60 shots. Yes. And it takes you as much as a minute to take to fire off another shot. It's probably about, okay, depending on, okay, how long does it take me in between shots? It's going to depend on my lighting. And it's going to depend on how much a light I'm putting on that particular subject because it, if I don't have the flash units firing much light, they're recharging much faster. <clears throat> if for some reason I have a light that's firing a lot of light, it's going to take longer to recharge. Uh, none, none, there was a, a minute, but I would say it's anywhere between uh, 15 seconds and 45 seconds. And these animals are staying still enough, and even with the stacking. Yes, but like I told you, you're looking, these are like prize fights to me. You're, you're looking at it when it worked. <laughs> because for the majority of the time, it does not work. Yeah. They move. Do you ever take a safety shot if you have the perfect position and you're not sure if the insect if the insect's going to stay there? Yeah. Do you ever take, like, close down the aperture and take a safety shot? Okay, so you're bringing up a great question. If I have a subject who I'm with for, let's say, a couple of hours or something, and I'm like, okay, I just invested this much time in this thing, and I'm not going to be able to get off some 50 series, you know, uh, stack or whatever, then yes, what I'll do is I'll close down the aperture, change my focal point to being longer on each shot, and instead of having a 100 series shot, I'll do a 20 series shot, and hope that it doesn't move. The problem is, is as you close the aperture, you're losing information, you're losing uh, detail. And you, the reason why these things are so sharp, and the reason why you're seeing all these things is because the aperture is so open, and because the, those focal points are so tight with each other. But in direct answer to your question, yes, I have done that. In fact, that lizard uh, that I showed earlier, that's exactly what I did. Is that there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. So I'm a lizard, I just hope so I'm going to get one, and that was what I got. That was one shot. No, 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 no. That, that was, uh, that was probably, uh, I'm going to guess that lizard was about 12 shots. Okay. Yeah. But no matter what, you, when you're doing the stacking, you are so in their grill, you are so right up against that animal that you, you can't close down the aperture enough to get the full, you know, depth of field. It's impossible. You, now, I've experimented out in the field um, to, to take an uh, image of something that's, you know, maybe F22 or something, and now, now just focus a little bit pass it look in front of it and get three shots. And sometimes you're really lucky that you're able to stitch those three shots together and it's a vast improvement of the one shot. There's still a lot of work that goes into it. There's a lot of work of stitching those three shots together, um, but you end up with something that if you were to compare the one shot with those three shots, it, you're just like, oh my god, that looks way better. But you're not going to go out in the field and do that for everything you see. You'll spend days and days. You can't. But sometimes you'll see the opportunity that presents itself, or at least I am now, and I'm okay, I'm gonna go for it, and I'll try those three, those three shots. Yes? You, you might have already answered it, but how many species, like percentage-wise, would you say you've invested time with that you like gave up and they got away and we'll never see the shots from? <laughs> you know, you're talking about for like the stacking like this? Yeah. Um, okay, so for, um, Monica asked me to, Monica curated this exhibit and she asked me to give her shots and I forget exactly how many shots I gave her. I mean, I gave her like 35 shots or something like that. They were 35 that I thought were strong shots. I probably had about 60 images that worked, um, but I have hundreds that didn't work. So you do still have like some, like the, that one or three shots of them? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, still, I still have all of that. 
you know, that didn't work. Well, what I'll do is in that situation is I'll keep one series. I don't keep them all because again, I shoot these with uh, Nikon uh, D810, and it creates these quite large uh, native files. And when you're doing a, a, you know 50 stack or 200 stack, and it fails, it fails, it fails, you can't keep all that information. I mean, you're just talking about you know terabytes of information. So I do let go of a lot of information, but on a, on a particular animal, I always keep one series of it, even if it's at work. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about the background uh, of uh, blackness. Mm -hmm. Now, you had a shot there in the studio against the poster board that you were doing, and it, it did not, it was not black. It, the black is a result of <coughs> the falling off of the image of the light. Exactly. Of the light. That's yeah, what, that is what the black. Correct. I don't know. I am not technical enough to tell you how this rule works. This is something inverse rule, and I, I have no idea exactly what it is. But essentially, especially out of flash, you can't use the sun because that light has traveled millions of miles to get here. But if you're using the flash, every time you, every space away from that flash, you're losing half the light in that space. Until it gets to the point where it completely drops off. Right. And so what I'm doing now, you probably noticed in those uh, two sh setup shots, is that I have I have the background at an angle. Um, a lot of these shots don't show it. I mean, they do if you look at closely enough, especially like that moth over there. But at the bottom of it, you can see the green, and then the top is just black. And that's just because the light fell off by the time it reached up to the top, and that's how I get that sort of gradient look. Initially, I was trying to figure out how to just make them dead black. And then I thought, well, that'll be easy enough. I'll just let it just completely fall off. Um, and then I think that that black uh, that that black spider wasp was I did that too. Um, but I realized, well, I can make it more interesting by putting some kind of color there, letting the letting it drop off. And then so that's what I did for the for all of these. Yes. Yeah. Is there a reason you wouldn't use a constant light and a Black. So yeah, the question is, uh, it would, using a constant light is compared to using the speed flashes. Um, there's a lot of discussion in this sort of stacking community, um, which I, I saw like I'm really involved, but I do my research to try to figure out how to make these better. Um, most people feel that the contrast that a flash makes allows the software that stacks these images together to do a better job. Um, constant light doesn't give that sharpness, but with that said, you can find some crazy stuff done with constant light, especially on the microscopic level. There's another problem though with me doing these things, is because these animals are constantly moving, um, the, the, my light sources aren't just pinned down to a very tight area. I'm having to use kind of a wide area because the thing's gonna move, and it's been moving around, and if I had it so specific onto that particular spot, and it moves, now the light's messed up. So for me, I realized, okay, I can use the speed lights, and sometimes I sort of snoop them down a little bit, but it's a flooding of light in a particular area, so then that way they can move within that area, and I don't have to worry about resetting up the lights again. Otherwise, I would never get any of these. Yes? So if you had a constant light, could you, couldn't you speed up the photography process? Yeah, so yes, you, yeah, you can, you yes. Have much better resolution because you were well, it's not that you would get better resolution. The resolution comes from how close you uh, move your next focus point to. Yeah, so you did 100. Well, again, that's 240 shots. Right. But, but, the, but the thing is, is that, right. You saw, but the, um, the thing is, is that uh, I did experiment with just light itself. And that was my early stages of doing this. And, and when I was stacking these together, I was having some problems. That's what I started researching, and that's where I found out in these threads where I was like, okay, uh, flash works much better because it's creating far more points of contrast, and it's allowing the software, whoever wrote the algorithms for the software, to you know move through these files and find these bits of pixels that it wants to use to all stitch together, and that's why. But again, there are some people who have mastered it. I, I, and, and yeah, and I thought about that. But another thing is that, like, uh, if you noticed um, one of my earlier shots, um, I take macro photography outside of Flash too. I'm very comfortable with Flash. So I didn't want to also 
re-figure out and relearn how to light these things with a constant light that the software would use, whatever, when I already had a handle on flashes already. I mean, the animal's going to move and the animal's not going to move. And, you know, even though, yeah, I probably would end up with a lot more with a constant light, if I end up with this look that I'm happy with with the flashes, then I'm, I'll give that up and I'll go for it with the flashes. What focal length lens were you using? Uh, all of these are done, what focal length lens is used for these. All of these are done with either a 100 millimeter Nikon 100 millimeter or um, a uh, Tokina, no, excuse me, Nikon 105 or a Tokina 100 millimeter. All of them with those two lenses. And for any of you who are into microphotography, um, that Tokina 100 millimeter 2.8 lens is a really good lens for the price. Um, the Nikon lens is obviously the, the Primo lens. Um, but it's twice as expensive. Um, they're now bringing up those two lenses and doing this, there's a problem with the uh, Tokina lens. This is that um, as you focus, uh, so let's look at the side, the lens from the side, right? As you focus, um, the lens moves out. And so if you're doing macro photography and you're again right up on something and you're focused, all you hit that thing. <laughs> and, and, and although I got used to that, and for years I used that lens, when I, when I was able to get my hands on um, the Nikon lens, that is internal focus. So when you're focused, you can come right out as a focus, 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 it never comes out. It's all internally focusing. And it's like, okay, I understand why that's worth more money because now you don't have to worry about bumping your subject. Because again, when you're doing active photography, you are so on your subject, you're just right there. So it's easy to bump into them. Yeah. Yes? That's sort of a comment. Have you seen the new Pro Photo Speedlight? I'm, I'm sorry? The new Pro Photo Speedlight? I'm not familiar. Okay, it's coming out in December and it will recharge in five one hundredths of a second. Fast. And we'll shoot 410 flashes continuously and rechargeable guys. So I just throw that right. Out. So yes, yeah, so that would be something that would interest me because again, I'm comfortable using flash. Right. So if I have something that recharge very, very fast, then I would do it. The other thing too is is that okay, so it's, it has 400 flashes. I mean, this is all it's, it all is called so maddening. You go through 400 shots so fast trying to do this. And then you don't realize that now that your flash charge begin to fall off and the lights begin to fall off. There's no fall off on it. But it just shuts off and that's it? No, it's recharging. It's a rechargeable battery. Uh -huh. So there's no fall off from the first um, flash to right. the last flash. So at the last flash, then it, it shuts down and you have to put it in, you have to put it in the batteries. So yeah, so I don't know. Because even with the Nikon flashes, as you saw with that series, <laughs> You know, they may say there's no fall off and Nikon makes really great products, but when you're, you know, actually doing it and you're in the studio and doing it, you'll notice like, okay, what flash is doing that? And there's always a flash that's going messing up, always. But like, what flash is, you know, five times is perfect, one time is it's backed off, five times perfect is backed off. As a nature of flash photography, it's the nature even in the outside of flash photography. You know, in bird photography, when I do my bird photography, sometimes I have a, a, I do flash and sometimes I don't. Um, but it's an imperfect thing. But in a way, that also makes these unique because of, of that being imperfect. Yes. Hey, question. I question. Some people, when they do um, bug photography, they usually do them early in the morning when it's colder, uh -huh. or when the bugs are kind of colder so they don't move as much. Mm -hmm. Did you take those photos in the morning, or did you cool them off with maybe with dry ice or something? Well, if you get dry ice, you would definitely kill them. Um, you can't cool the bug down to get it to slow down. That you can. Um, because bugs have like this antifreeze in them, and as long as you do it at a very slow rate, they'll slow them down. Um, but take beetles, for instance, like that carrion beetle over there. You could you could almost freeze that beetle, and he ain't gonna stop moving. And the thing is about all these animals is, is that they all behave in different ways, and they all have they exploit different niches, and they do things in different ways. And what I found works best for me is just, uh, I know it's not ridiculous, but it's, it's kind of getting into that animal's head. And it's like, okay, you know, well, how do you behave? How does a moth behave? I mean, I'll give you a great example. That's Sarah Orange tip right there. Um, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how I got that photo. One thing I know about butterflies is, and it kind of leads into what you're saying, but a little, a little bit different angle, is that butterflies are active during the day, right? Moths for the most part at night. Now, moths during the day, you can't stop them moving. Don't care, don't move whatever they want to move, but butterflies go to sleep. And 
although they may not be in the position you want them to be in when they go to sleep, they go to sleep. So the way I got that image was um, caught the butterfly, I think that's verbena, is that verbena, Susan? The, what, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I picked that verbena flower. And I have a long cylindrical tube, and I put the verbena flower in there with the butterfly, and the butterfly flew around, and he landed on that, and I just put it aside. Another thing about insects and birds, and all animals are, it goes for all of them, it's very bizarre, I don't know how to do it. They know when night is, they know when day is, they, they, they know somehow. And it's not like I could go, okay, I'm going to take that butterfly and I'm going to go put it in a closet and shut the closet and in two hours come back and take pictures of it. It's going to be flying around like it knows it's day and I don't know how they do it. But I do know that that butterfly is going to fall asleep when it's night. So I left. Set my alarm. I don't know what it's like, 3 30 in the morning. <laughs> but prior, prior to that, I had set up my whole set. I came in, opened the door, I said, like, okay. And I looked, and it was at that position on the flower. Oh, oh my god. So I just slowly took it off, took it out, put it down. It's like 4 o'clock in the morning. And I was able to get series of it before I woke up. So it's like you, you have to sort of figure out, you know, how you corral that animal, you know, and, and there's not one thing to do it. All of them behave different ways. They're all they're all different. So yes, you can use data right, but you have to use it a different way. Yeah. So one question about the end product. Yes. The printing. Yes. How do you how do you print? Uh, I wouldn't be the one to answer that. Uh, the gentleman who printed is here, Tom Cruise. So he's the one who printed these. Essentially, he told me, all right, give me a file uh, at this resolution. Um, I have them sharpened to the point where I know I'm comfortable with sharpening them too. Um, he felt as though they needed to be sharpened more for his process. I said, fine, go for it. So he sharpened them more to that point so they would look right on particular papers. This is uh, printed on um, a really nice hard rag paper, um, and the bird pictures are on a nice Epson glossy paper. But when it comes to the technical aspects of that, I, I handle that off the time. Yeah, and they look gorgeous. Right. First one of those All right, so any other questions? Uh, yeah, it's all, it's all different. I mean, I kind of use A as my baseline, and I'll go one way or the other from A to pinning. But again, as that earlier question, it's going to depend on how skilled that animal is going to be. If I think something's going to be rock solid like that, then I'll all going to be the more and just make that focal point get tighter, tighter, tighter. I mean, that image there, I just it just blows my mind that I was able to get it because. He just never was moving. He wasn't, well, once I got to that one, he was just never moving, never moving, never moving. And what happens is, is that when you're done with that, you're like, oh my god, oh my god, I gotta run it through the software and see what happened. You know, you're just like, oh my god. And more often than not, it's oh shoot. No. But, <laughs> but that one, I was like, oh my god. And I, I don't know what happened. I was really open on that and doing super, super tight focal points and work. So you just you judge. You yeah. just judge on the animal. And, how are you moving the focal point, the, um, the, the focus? Are the focus is being moved from an iPad. Um, it's through the software that's run through that. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Cam, Cam Ranger. Well, oh, that's what that, that Cam just, Ranger software. That changes the focus of the camera. Wait, so what happens with Cam Ranger is, is um, uh, it, it controls either a it, it's written, it, the software's written so it can control an icon or a camera. And basically, through its USB hub or whatever, um, you're connected directly to the camera and it commandeers the camera. Now you can do nothing on the camera itself, but you can do everything from the iPad, including focus. And you can have it autofocus, you can pick a point to autofocus, or you can manual focus, you can tell it what your manual focus points to be, you can tell it everything. It's really, really cool. So you're tapping on the picture as it's going in? I'm tapping on, there happens to be uh, focal arrows, and so I'm tapping on a focal arrow depending on what direction my series is going. And, how, and I've already set that parameter of what that focus will be. So yeah, so essentially it's, I tap expose, tap the focal point, watch the image come up. Oh, he didn't move, I don't think. Go again, go again. That's, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Yes? It's a terrible question. What? Isn't there some way to spray with an anesthetic? Um, you know, there are so many different things that you can do with insects. Insects, for the most part, are extremely hardy. Um, and they take a lot, and the reason why they've been here for millions and millions of years. Um, 
I don't spray them on anything, but the closest thing I can say that I have done is use carbon monoxide and carbon my breath. Um, because carbon monoxide will slow them down. Um, they'll, they'll, they kind of makes them sleepy. But here's a problem with that. Because you get a sleepy bee, it just falls over. <laughs> so, so you know, it's like, that, you can stop the animal from moving, but if it's on its back, it's not, that's not an interesting you know, image. And, and, and for, some, if for some butterflies, too, butterflies, you, know, if you're, you can put them to sleep with your breath, but a butterfly that's asleep is not. It's not going to be a good image. All right? Cool. All right. Well, thank you.